Hello everyone, and welcome to this module's discussion of gender, sex, and sexuality in popular culture. So before we get into the details of what these are, or rather how these act within popular culture, or what these mean within popular culture, I think it's first important to really kind of give some definitions or give a better sense of what these are these things are or how we understand them. So first is gender and gender we can understand as the attributes such as personality, ability, and interests interconnected to a person's sex. And the terms we often associate with these would be masculinity, femininity, androgyny, and transgender. Now with transgender that term will show up a lot but gender is one of the ways in which we would discuss it. We also have the term sex. Now sex refers to the biological and physiological traits of a person that determines their role in reproduction. So in this case we have male sex, female sex, intersex, which is a person who might have uh, either ambiguous or mixed sexual reproduction uh, parts, and transsex, which would be a person who transitions from one sex to another. Here again, you know, when we talk about sex, we're talking solely about that reproduction function. Um, and what we need to understand is that gender is different from sex, right? So you can be a male, but you don't have to be masculine. And then sexuality. And this is the physical emotional attraction to a person, often based upon that person's sex or gender and or gender or the ways in which the sex and gender go together. So we have heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, pansexual. These are all terms of people in how or, or who they find themselves attracted to. So what we can understand is that each of these can be understood or presented along a continuum. So we have sex, and we have a continuum of male to female. And I think what's important to understand is that they're particularly as we talk about intersex and transsex, we can understand that the we, we may have absolute categories here, but those categories aren't as clear as one, might, as one might imagine. For instance, when you take a look at the things that are supposed to make male and female different, um, they're not as clear cut. There's a, there's a range there. You know, for instance, estrogen and testosterone. Well, both male and females have estrogen and testosterone. So saying that one is stro solely a female uh, hormone and the other one is a male doesn't quite make sense. Uh, sexuality, again, we have, you know, that this continuum from heterosexuality to homosexuality. Um, and we can kind of think, you know, we can kind of think of it as that, but there's also a mix of different, um, different attractions throughout that whole Line, uh, throughout that whole continuum. Similarly, we have masculine and feminine, and a whole range of expressing one's gender, uh, you know, a whole range of how one um, understands their gender. We also have gender identity, uh, and this, so masculine, feminine is, uh, I would say, how the culture perceives you, or how what you present is understood to fit into that cultural norm of masculine and feminine, but then we also have gender identity, and this might be how the person as an individual identifies. So, you know, this is different from masculine and feminine because the person may identify as a boy slash man or a girl slash woman, even though others are perceiving or representing that person as feminine. Um, that gender identity is how an individual reconciles his or her sex with his or her gender, and that's different necessarily from gender itself, because gender is often intertwined or intermixed with cultural and with culture and cultural interactions. So as you can see, I mean, when we talk about these things, they all kind of intersect, they all interrelate, and they're all along a continuum. There's not necessarily um, either or. Our culture loves to put things into either or, but there's a lot more mixture than we often give credit for. Alright, so how does all this fit, fit, with, gen, uh, fit with popular culture? 
Well, it provides examples, which I think is really important, um, especially if we look at the last 20 years and the range of examples of people of different genders, sex, and sexuality. There has always been historically um, examples of non-heterosexual, or what we'll talk about shortly, non-heteronormative examples, but they've often been negative, they've often been as a point to keep others in line, that is to present a non non-masculine male historically has been to show that male as insubstantial, to show that male as not man enough, as it were. But I think particularly in the last 20 years, uh, we've seen more positive examples and a wider range of examples around gender, sex, and sexuality. The other challenge, of course, is that it creates stereotypes, um, that when we present a particular gender, sex, and sexuality that isn't the norm, um, it can create stereotypes around, oh, that's what you know a person like that is supposed to be. It also provides choices. Now, to clarify, I, I'm not implying that gender, sex, and sexuality are conscious choices. Uh, in a lot of ways, I don't think they are. But I think for somebody that's trying to understand their identity, it helps them to see these examples and to then make choices based around that. Uh, I used to work in a residential program for uh, gay, lesbian, by trans youth and one of the things that was really great was within culture they could look and they could they could make better choices I don't know they could make choices on who to emulate depending on how they identified and it was really useful for them it was powerful for them to be able to choose you know and not be stuck with a singular representation of what their identity is supposed to be that being said, it can, those you know those representations can also create expectations of, you know, along with the stereotypes, this is how you're supposed to act, or this is what you're supposed to look to as a role model. And it provides complexity, which I think is important. Uh, I think you know if, if we look at the history of it, depiction of representation of uh, people of of non-heteronormative gender, sex, and sexuality were often disregarded or less valued. Um, in, in, of course, in many ways they, that still happens in today's culture, but I think the more we see examples that are not part of the heteronormative viewpoint, we actually learn of their complexities, their challenges, and I think that's important. But I think the other challenge, of course, is that it creates confusion, especially for people coming into their identity um, around gender, sex, and sexuality. It can be challenging to negotiate it all, um, to understand it. And, you know, you have to figure life for many of us is already chaotic and challenging and filled with its own um, mountains to climb, and this is just one more thing to throw into the mix. All right. So... In thinking about gender, sex, and sexuality, I think there's there's some considerations about these concepts or about these ideas that are worth noting. The first is that they're fluid, um, or they have the potential to be fluid. Alfred Kinsey, who's this famous uh, sexologist from the early half of the 20th century, uh, this is one of the things that, that he looked at in in he viewed as as potential, um, particularly when it comes to gender. Uh, there is some more fluidity going on there, depending on time, place, and person. I think that some of these also have the potential to be fluid throughout one person's life, depending on where they go in their life and, and what events occur to them. Position. Uh, the, how the individual comes to identify with their gender, sex, and sexuality often is determined by both nature and nurture. That is, there is certainly uh, a mixture of both at play here. That they, that uh, you know, we see within the literature that increasingly it's believed that nature uh, plays a huge role in this. But there are elements, certainly around nurture, as to how it comes expressed. I think when we look at something as um, sexuality and how a person 
a, a person may identify as heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, etc., but the opportunities they have to express that, to embrace that, and how they embrace that or don't embrace that uh, certainly often come about through culture or nurture. And that variety, uh, you know, I've laid out a couple of different terms here, and you know, we saw that continuum on the on the previous slide. But really, there's many different ways of understanding these, and there, there's a wider variety than just what's been laid out. Um, there's asexuality, omnisexual, intersexual. You know, there's a lot of different things that are going on here. It's not just either or, as I mentioned before. So let's take a look at some examples of gender, sex, and sexuality within culture that I think are worth um, just recognizing that they're there and being aware of just they really do permeate everywhere in our culture. So here I have Hulk Hogan and when we look at wrestling what we see is a very masculine performance that is as some would argue, as there's a certain degree of homoeroticism that goes on when, you know, these men get dressed up in these audacious outfits and are often, you know, covered in oil and they are grappling with one another. And actually, you know, when you look at particularly professional wrestling, it's very much dramatic. It's it's more about the drama of it all. And so there is some some look or you could understand elements or you could raise questions about the elements of the hyper masculinity of wrestling and wonder what's going on there. Uh, I think a really interesting example is the character Kurt from the show Glee. Uh, and you know, as a young adult male coming out on a show um, and dealing with issues of homosexuality within within mainstream television and talking about how that impacts, of course, um, the high school experience. And in Kurt's example, you know, you have both his his sexuality and his gender very interesting because he's often very much presenting a a feminine uh, a a feminine gender with a homosexuality sexuality. So, you know, we see in certain ways, as we talked about before, there's questions around or there, there's concerns around Kurt being considered a, um, a stereotype. Of course, I think the show does well in balancing that out with offering other representations of non-heterosexuals. Uh, the character Captain Jack Harkness from the television series Torchwood uh, is a good example of a bisexual who is presented in a very fascinating light um, throughout the show and is certainly, I think, one of the most interesting elements about Harkness as a character is there is he's a masculine character, or I would say he has masculine elements and he has a lighter touch at other times. Ellen DeGeneres, of course, a very famous, um, very famous homosexual who has certainly changed significantly our culture's perceptions of homosexuals over the last 15 years. Uh, her, her presentation, her interactions have really done some interesting things. And I think what's fascinating about Ellen is that, you know, we understand her or she's, you know, revealed her her sexuality but if you go and you watch the show I it's fascinating to try to see or I think what she does with gender is interesting because she manages to provide or to illustrate a, a fairly neutral gender um, there are certainly things that she does that would be considered feminine and that there's certain ways in which she acts that could be considered masculine it's a very interesting balancing act Chaz Bono, the now son of Cher, who was born female but transitioned or has been in the process of transitioning to male. The TV show Orange is the New Black on Netflix is a fascinating show. Um, actually, it could tie into our module on race, class, and ethnicity, but also tie into our discussions around gender, sex, and sexuality as we see different characters, how they exhibit and identify with their gender, sex, and sexuality. 
RuPaul, whose famous uh, reality TV series RuPaul's Drag Race, is also another interesting depiction of a, um, one might argue, a transgender person, or might just uh, identify the person as a male who dresses and depicts, uh, depicts him or herself as female. Uh, it, there, there's various camps around that, but I think is a very interesting, I would also say positive representation of, you know, what this, uh, what this particular identity embraces or represents. There's, of course, the uh, very famous pride parades that often occur in June uh, throughout the country, whether it's in San Francisco, P-Town, uh, there's, uh, there's even one in Salem, Massachusetts, the North Shore Pride. So here again is, you know, this is a fascinating um, cultural example where com large communities of all different genders, sex, and sexualities come together to celebrate this wide range of uh, different identities and these happen you know all over the country and really I think it's a very interesting change from you know 30 or 40 years ago the ways in which there is an embrace of this there is a recognition of the important elements um, in the ways in which uh, this fits within our culture and I would come back to, you know, sports. And again, here, football is another one in which you have hyper-masculinity. It's, we see it all, we see it sectioned off. It's all males. And the idea is, of course, to, um, to outperform the other, the other team. But there, there's, again, there's all sorts of questionable things that occur here that the, the hyper-sexuality, the hyper-masculinity of sports culture um, really does raise questions or red flags about um, why the need for certain things and how in the ways in which they are pushed to be aggressive and eliminate all things that are not masculine in themselves. There, there's a lot of research and, and discussion and, and thoughts around that. All right, so all of this is relevant and useful, and it brings us to this question of queer theory, because it's queer theory that's kind of allowed for us to start to see, value, and appreciate um, these other types of identities. And I'm going to just give a very clear definition, or give a, a, a prepackaged definition here for us to kind of sit with. Queer theory is a set of ideas based around the idea that identities are not fixed and do not determine who we are. It suggests that it is meaningless to talk in general about women or any other group as identities consist of, as identities consist of so many elements that to assume that a person that people can be collectively on the basis of one shared characteristic is wrong. Indeed, it proposes that we deliberately challenge all notions of fixed identity in varied and non-predictable ways. So, that's at a crux what queer theory is. So what that means is I'm sure many of you hear queer theory and I certainly have seen this happen before you assume oh it's about you know I've heard one person you know say and kind of floored me oh so you study gay people. Um, no that's not what queer theory is. Queer theory is really understanding that we're not fixed with our identity in that to use one, to use a category to understand a person when that person is con composed of so many different elements seems um, outright wrong or seems problematic. In that we, in looking at any individual who is defined by others as that characteristic means we want to look beneath the surface of that. We don't want to accept that as fact. If somebody, if a character is portrayed or depicted as a woman, then we want to undermine that. We want to see all the ways in which she is not a woman, um, that she is other things besides just that singular label. And all of this connects to this term that I've mentioned a few times in this, in this uh, lecture is uh, the term heteronormative, heteronormativity. Now, this is going to sound a little bit 
confusing, but we'll work on that. Uh, heteronormative discursive practices or techniques are multiple in organized categories of identity into hierarchy, hierarchical binaries. That means that man has been set up as the opposite and superior of woman, and heterosexual as the opposite and superior of homosexual. It is through heteronormative discursive practices that lesbian gay lives are marginalized socially and politically, and as a result can be invisible within social spaces such as schools. So what this means is, we, ha as I talked about before, we love our binaries, right? Male, female, masculine, feminine, uh, heterosexual, homosexual. And within culture, there there's a privileging that goes on here, a hierarchy that's su that's supported. So we see that a male heterosexual, at least historically, has been a place of power and privilege. The opportunities and choices afforded a male heterosexual have been significantly more than even a female who's heterosexual. And if we think about this, this is true when we look at rights, when we look at access, when we look at pay, uh, equal pay. So heteronormative, heteronormativity has been a strong element in our culture, and it still lingers. We still have situations today where, um, you know, where we can see differences in, you know, um, pay between men and women. We can see differences in, in education. Uh, as, the, as the quote there talks about schools, one of the most fascinating is many schools accept funds from the government that, from the government for abstinence-only education. And abstinence-only education does not even talk about homosexuality. So if you're in high school and you're getting your sex education, your identity is completely ignored is completely irrelevant because abstinence only education promotes abstinence until you're married and in many states still homosexuals can't get married so how does that represent or how do how does somebody who identifies as homosexual actually you know believe they are of equal value i think a good way to to think about this or to, to understand this is um, creator Ryan Murphy, who again did Glee, um, also did the show Nip Tuck. And he identified or discussed the story as Nip Tuck is essentially a love story between two heterosexual men. And many people are confounded by that or don't really understand it. It's not, you know, the relationship between the two main characters is something that mainstream culture doesn't always fully understand. And this image here, this uh, image here, I think, is, really does well to sum up the different and overlapping identities around gender, sex, and sexuality. If you want to look at it some more, I would recommend just pausing and trying to see all the different ways in which these overlap. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next video.